land out of growing food for people that need it and into growing biofuels for clunkers that don't, she said, now they can't even afford the mud pies. That is what happens, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't get the science right, if we just drift into making policy decisions in haste. Here is the African energy cycle. It starts with timber as the source, carried, transmitted on the back of the people, burnt in smoke-filled huts with no proper chimneys, so that all the children die of respiratory diseases. That is the energy cycle of Africa to which those who wish to shut down the carbon economies of the West would commit Africa indefinitely. In fact, if we're going to lift Africa and China and India and South America out of the totally unnecessary poverty in which they are still compelled to live, they must be allowed to find the cheapest way of generating the electricity which everywhere that it has been introduced has been the fastest way to lift people out of poverty. And the cheapest way to do that is to use what you've got plenty of here in Australia, fossil fuels. So if the threat is real, why do they lie? They even tell you they're going to lie. This character here is Sir John Horton. He was the first chairman of the science panel of the UN's climate panel. Unless we announce disasters, he said in a book he wrote, then no one will listen. But why should you announce disasters when you know perfectly well, such as with the Himalayas, that there aren't going to be any? It's just lies. Here's Stephen Schneider. We have to offer up scary scenarios, he said. No, we don't. All we have to offer up is the truth and leave it to the common sense of the people to do the right thing. Here's another one. We're all going to lie. Global warming can mean colder, it can mean drier, it can mean wetter. That's what we're talking about. That's from a Greenpeace activist. They don't care which way the weather is going to go, they're going to blame it on global warming. And then, of course, the arch liar of them all, St. Albert Arnold Gorblimey. And he says, he says, I believe it is appropriate... Uh, to have an over-representation of factual presentations on how dangerous it is. Well, let's see the kind of lies he tells. This is on the publicity poster for his movie, his mawkish sci-fi comedy horror movie. And what he says is this. Um, he says that he, there is the temperature going up. What's wrong with that graph? Let's see who can spot it. There's something terribly, terribly wrong with it. Anyone like to holler out? Yes, thank you very much. Exactly. You've got a re-entrant there. You've got the graph going backwards in a way which it couldn't possibly do, just below the word all there. Um, there's no way that could happen. That graph was simply drawn by a PR executive because that's where, that's where Gore gets his science from, as far as I can see. And here are the nine lies that the judge in the higher court... Uh, certified that Gore had made in his movie. I'm not going to go through each of them. You'll be pleased to hear. We'll pick out just one or two of them. But the, the, the judge was, was excoriating Gore for having told all these lies. First of all, we start with the big one, which is, which is the sea level lie. If sea level isn't actually going to rise, then you don't have a problem with the climate, because that's really the only scare that might actually do any serious damage. Now, what the UN's climate panel says, and they are prone to exaggeration is that the melting of the, Arctic, the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets might, over the next century, cause six centimetres, which to me is about two and a half inches, of sea level rise worldwide. That is all. Al Gore says 20 feet, which would be, in your money, 610 <laughs> centimetres. No correlation between the two at all. This is what the judge had to say about it. The Armageddon scenario that he depicts is not based on any scientific view. And how many of you saw that reported in the Sydney Morning Herald? Or on A, B, C? No, I didn't think so. But did Gore believe his sea level la? Well, no, he didn't, because in the very year he was making the movie in which the la was enshrined, uh, he bought a condominium in the St. Regis Tower, you see on the left there, in San Francisco, for $4 million, just feet from the ocean at Fisherman's Wharf. There's no way he'd have bought that if he knew the whole thing was going to be flooded from the ground up as soon as he bought it. <laughs> then, of course, there's the polar bears, la. 
where he says that a scientific study shows for the first time that they're finding polar bears that have drowned, <laughs> swimming miles and miles <laughs> to find the ice. I apologise for the accent. <laughs> anyway, the truth of it is this, that the paper that he cited actually showed just four polar bears that died in the Beaufort Sea. Here they are, each of them ringed. And they were killed, according to the paper concerned, not by global warming, but by a very bad storm. And the technical term that we scientists have for that is, shit happens. <laughs> So, I thought I'd check a little bit further to find out whether, in fact, in the Beaufort Sea there had been such a loss of sea ice that these poor polar bears would have had to swim too far and they wouldn't have been able to make it. And here is the trend in sea ice in the Beaufort Sea. The blue lines are the actual individual annual me measurements that jump up and down. The trend is the red line, which you'll see actually rises very gently. So there was an increase in sea ice over the 30-year period, and therefore there was no way that loss of sea ice could possibly have caused the death of those polar bears. Every aspect of that story was and remains pure fiction. Then there's the Kilimanjaro lie. Now, this is Mount Kilimanjaro, more than 30 years ago, and more recently. That's what he says in his film. You can see them there. There's quite a lot less ass on Mount Kilimanjaro uh, 30, today than there was 30 years ago. But I wanted to have a look at what was the record of temperature at the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro over the last 30 years, which is monitored now by satellites who do it very accurately using thermometers on board and reference measurements from outer space and from the surface. It's an extremely elaborate method of measurement. And then they can check what the temperature at the summit has. They have a continuous record there for 30 years. There is practically a zero trend throughout the last 30 years. Whatever was causing the melting of the ass, it was nothing whatever to do with global warming because, in fact, there's been regional cooling in that region, as you can see on the map here. And therefore, whatever it was, it wasn't global warming, was it? Now, Al Gore knew this perfectly well, and yet he put that in his film. And uh, as a further check, most of the ice on Kilimanjaro had actually gone before 1936, when Hemingway wrote his book, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. This has been a long-term recession of the ice caused by a gradual cooling and drying of the climate in the region. It has nothing whatever to do with any kind of warming. So, Al Baby, I challenged you three years ago to a public debate on this on international television and I'm still waiting, Al Baby. <laughs> so what then is the truth about today's climate? We're going to run through this very quickly because you are all a pretty good educated audience. I mean, let's just take a vote. How many of you here think that global warming could possibly be a global crisis. No, nobody. Right, oh, there is one. All right, you're fired. And, <laughs> and as for the rest of you, that's the end of my talk. Um, so the truth about today's cli climate, here is the temperature record for the last nine years since the beginning of the new millennium on the 1st of January 2001. That is a falling trend, and it is a statistically significant falling trend. You will see what the IPCC predicted in the pink zone above it. They don't quite match very well, do they? Then we have the uh, sea ice extent in the Arctic, which follows this regular up-and-down pattern with the seasons, and as you can see, there's no particular unusual thing going on there. Then we have that story that in 2007, 27% of the summer minimum sea ice that would normally be expected to be there, according to the satellites, had gone, and this was because of global warming. How many of you saw that story? Yes, quite a lot, I thought so. But in fact, in 2008, half of the missing ice came back. In 2009, the rest of it came back, and the purple areas there are 2007, 2008, 2009, respectively. In Greenland, where you hear that it's all melting and falling into the sea, Johannesson et al. 2005, once again using satellites, this time doing satellite altimetry, which is the most accurate way to measure this, found that for 11 continuous years, there was a 5 centimetre per year increase in the average thickness of the entire Greenland ice sheet. Not, you might think, the profile of a continent about to become green again, as its name implies. 
And here, I was so surprised.